Hello everybody. Uh, welcome everyone to today's talk. The topic is dietary fiber as a multifunctional food component for human health. It is the 11th talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope the series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field, as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker today, Professor Peter Zhang. He obtained his PhD from the University of New South Wales in Australia and is the current director of the Food Research Center and associate director of the Food and Nutritional Sciences Program in the School of Life Sciences at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Professor Zhang's primary research interest is on bioactive components in functional foods with a main focus on the structure and function of dietary fiber, non-starch polysaccharides. His most recent work is on the research and development of polysaccharides as novel prebiotics using unmixed technology and animal models. He is the associate editor of Bioactive Carbohydrates and Dietary Fibers and editorial board members of the International Journal of Medicinal Mushrooms and Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry. He is the author and co-author of over 150 SCI publications. In the following presentation, he is going to provide an overview based on the current research on the chemical structure of dietary fibers and its relationship with the physiological functions that are benefits, but they are beneficial to humans. Now, please welcome Professor Zhang to the floor. Peter, please. Okay, thank you, Professor Lam's introduction. Um, so tonight I'm going to share with you um, on the dietary fiber uh, as a um, multifunctional uh, food components for human health. Uh, first, I would say good evening, good morning, good afternoon, maybe, right, to our various uh, guests uh, from different parts of the world. Okay, uh, first, uh, I think uh, tonight's talk, I think I plan to use maybe 40 minutes or 50 minutes or so um, to talk about this topic. So the outline of my talk uh, will include, of course, um, first to define what is dietary fiber. Then we'll look at um, what are the uh, components that constitute dietary fiber. Then we'll look at, um, at the moment, there are different uh, cell wall models uh, in the origins of dietary fiber. Then uh, perhaps I think more importantly is uh, we'll look at um, why dietary fiber is so special in terms of its physical chemical properties and how it, these properties are related to the physiological functions of dietary fiber. And lastly, I will briefly perhaps talk a little bit about um, a specific type of dietary fiber, which is mushroom poly, uh, mushroom beta glucans, uh, which is a dietary fiber, um, which is uh, Currently, uh, the focus of my uh, lab research. So, what's the definition of dietary fiber? And I would say it's a very difficult term to de define. Um, I would say dietary fiber is a concept rather than a well described chemical entity. It depends on which field um, you're looking at dietary fiber. Now, if you are uh, a botanist, I think dietary fiber to you uh, will perhaps only refer to the uh, rigid fibrous cell wall constituents. And as we'll see later, um, cell wall constituents, or we call cell wall materials, really constitute uh, most of the dietary fiber that we're talking about. And if you're interested in the physiological aspect, then dietary fiber will refer to as Trowell, uh, who is the pioneer. Uh, scientists who um, really 
looking at the physiological functions of dietary fiber, he defined it as the remnants of plant cells that are resistant to hydrolysis by the human elementary enzymes. How uh, fiber come into the context uh, with human physiology is referred to the digestions in uh, the um, human gut. Then if you more interested in the chemical aspect or you're a chemist, then one would define dietary fiber like Angus, another uh, well-known uh, chemist who defined dietary fiber as non-starch polysaccharides in plant foods. Now those are, I think, more about the, um, uh, the early part of uh, dietary fiber research. Now perhaps uh, we can take a look at this um, uh, slide, perhaps just to explain a bit more about how we can define or what are the criteria that define dietary fiber. And um, we know dietary fiber uh, refer to something that we, we ingest, okay, it's part of a diet. So um, the fiber, it can, the meaning of the fiber it carries doesn't talk about like optic fiber or synthetic fiber, those things. Fiber is be part of our diet. And when we, uh, when when the when our food that contain fiber ingested into uh, our digestive system, we know that digestion will start of course from the uh, uh, stomach, and then to the small intestines and even in the colon. So um, dietary fiber should be resistant to the upper gut tract, meaning that fibers remain intact uh, in the, both in the stomach and in the small intestine, but not in the colon as we will see later because something will happen to fiber. And of course dietary fiber we're talking about is um, uh, should have some health benefits okay, to the host. And then it comes the fermentation of the dietary fiber by the intestinal microbiota. So this would happen when fiber enter into the human colon, so including the uh, ascending transverse and descending colon. And depending on which part of the colon, there are different degree of this uh, fermentation. And again, later on, we will see the ferment, uh, we will see the fermentability of a dietary fiber uh, has a very close uh, correlation with uh, the human health. And then regarding to the uh, fermentation by the microbiota, um, dietary fiber um, should have a, or should be, I would say, selectively uh, stimulate uh, certain bacteria in our gut. And this is known as the probiotic, which are known as a uh, good bacteria. And in this regard, I think recently, um, instead of using the term dietary fiber, I think people are now using the term prebiotic, which are referred to a special type of dietary fiber that can selectively stimulate the good bacteria probiotic. And lastly, uh, fiber, of course, contained in our food and the stability of the fiber during the processing conditions is, of, of, of course, uh, it's important and a lot of research are looking at it. Uh, maybe we'll look at a more recent definitions of dietary fiber. So ODEX is of course the international organization. Um, so according to the uh, Codex Alimentarius uh, Commissions in 2010, this comes the, I would say, a more uh, uh, recent di uh, dietary fiber definition. So dietary fiber means carbohydrate polymers. Now, with 10 or more monomeric units, we call it degree of polymerization, which are non-digestive, not hydrolyzed by the endogenous enzyme in humans and animals, and not absorbed in the small intestine. Now, if you look at this statement, so actually it have include perhaps um, what we have seen in the first slide, um, both the botanical, the physiological, and also the chemical aspect. So fiber in terms of its chemical structure, it should be a polymer with at least 10 or more sugar units. And in terms of the physiology, it should be non-digestible by human enzymes and not absorbed in the small intestine. Now, uh, other than the codex, uh, I would like to also quote uh, the European Food Safety Authority and the FDA. They have also a more refined definitions of dietary fiber. So both these uh, associations, they define fiber, uh, they have adopted a wider definition of dietary fiber to include 
all carbohydrates that are neither digested nor absorbed in the small intestine and have a DP of three or more mono unit, uh, mon monomeric units. Now you have see in this so-called wider definition of dietary fiber, uh, it includes all carbohydrates. So when we say all, you'll see later actually it doesn't uh, to be restricted uh, to plant cell or to cell wall uh, materials only. And it also lowered the degree of the polymerization to only three. Now, this is because uh, with modern <clears throat> research on dietary fiber, uh, we find that um, polymer with DP, uh, even with only three units, actually they also can be non-digestible and they also have physiological impact. So um, it's a wider definition because as you see in the second statement, they also specify that synthetic and extracted fiber, they are not intrinsic to plant cell, can also demonstrate physiological effects to human health prior to being declared a dietary fiber. So right now, dietary fiber, so to most of us, so it is not only restricted to plant cell materials, plant cell wall materials, to be exact, and it includes synthetic and even uh, extracted fiber. Uh, the last definition I would like to go here, I would say perhaps is, um, is by the AACC. It's, uh, I would say it, it has um, a more expanded uh, definition. First, uh, it talks about fiber as the edible parts of plants or an organic carbohydrate. That means other types of carbohydrate that are resistant to digestion, absorption of human intestine, small intestine with complete or partial fermentation in the large intestine. I think this is a very important aspect, uh, including not only is resistant to human digestion, talking about its fermentation in the large intestine. And AC definition, uh, we have polysaccharides, oligosaccharides, uh, which are both um, carbohydrates. And it also includes other non-carbohydrate um, materials, including like lignin and other associated plant substances in the dietary fiber because, uh, which I don't have time to <laughs> talk much about this, they also have the characteristic okay, of the dietary fiber. And lastly, of course, dietary fiber should promote beneficial physiological effects. And some of the uh, these effects that have, have been demonstrated or validated are uh, including laxation, uh, blood cholesterol attenuation, and blood glucose attenuation. But other than these three, I would say um, um, a lot of research now have uh, emerging uh, data coming up that there are uh, physiological effects other than this have uh, been uh, related to dietary fiber intake. Then let's take a look at the content of dietary fiber. Um, broadly speaking, uh, dietary fiber are non-starch polysaccharides because um, normally starch should be totally digestible by human enzymes. But as we see later, there are some exceptions. Uh, the list here is uh, just a list of the um, non-starch polysaccharides. So uh, if you look at them, uh, actually they can all be found uh, particularly in plant cell wall. And of course you can also have, uh, uh, that, that can be found uh, mainly if they are plant origin. And then we have oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides should have a degree of polymerization, uh, usually from three to 10. So these are some of the current um, common uh, or Oligosaccharides, uh, including oligofluctan, sometimes you call FOS, and then you have the collector oligosaccharide, we call it GOS. Now, then the next category uh, is the an analogous carbon hybrids. Now, if you look at the list here, now actually most of these, they are not uh, from derived from the plant cell wall materials. Okay, but um, they can be considered as stratified because um, they fulfill the definitions of dietary fiber that we have seen. And most of these are actually, they are, are used as uh, food ingredients in the food industry to produce uh, 
high fiber food. Okay. And some of them are actually, they have been uh, modified. I just pick one example, for example, cellulose. Now cellulose, cellulose to us, okay, is this, of course we know it's insoluble in water, it's very inert, okay, because it's the building block of the plant cell wall. But if it's been chemically modified, in this case, like by the hydroxypropylmethane, it has changed its properties. In particular, it becomes water soluble. Okay, which again we will see the water solubility of high fiber is a very important physiological uh, properties that will affect its uh, physiological functions. Okay, and then next, then associated substances, as I said, uh, uh, they are now uh, research showing that they are also active. Okay, they they also have a uh, biological activity in the human. Now, uh, concerning the cell wall model, uh, I think this one this is the earlier one showing from the yeast cell wall. And in fact, uh, I think um, this is one of the, uh, I would say, earliest model that um, people are looking at the uh, cell wall component in yeast. And uh, as shown in here, you see um, in the cell wall, actually there are layer of, of structures and, and all these, um, this layer of structure like uh, beta gluten with different linkage, 1316, and then some of the, um, like chitin, which is uh, a similar uh, structural polysaccharide, similar to cellulose, but it can only be found in fungi, mushroom, and other crustaceans. So, um, you can see the, uh, this uh, all dietary fiber component that constitute uh, the cell wall. And another model here I show to you is, uh, uh, comparing, of course, yeast, uh, even with uh, mold like as aspergillus, and again, the fiber, the cell wall components shown in here, okay, it gives you a you have the better structure of the uh, polysaccharides that constitute dye fiber. So they are usually they have a linear, uh, long chain, and then with different branching and different sugar and different units. And uh, what is shown in here is also the solubility, and a lot of dietary fiber. Um, depends on this uh, sugar component and linkage. They may not be that water soluble, but they can be soluble in alkaline. So you have alkaline soluble fraction and alkaline soluble fractions. Now, uh, okay, uh, this comes from a recent review um, that I want to show you is the physical chemical characteristics of fiber and their location in the plant cell. So in higher plant, so you have a uh, this typical higher plant cell. So you see that this, if you take a closer look at the cell wall, so this is the typical uh, cell wall structure of high plant, and you can see the um, the rock light, or you can see the bundle of this uh, cellulose bundle doing here, and then this bundle of cellulose that sit in a matrix of but of uh, materials, and based on this, you have this solid. We can further divide it into soluble fiber which includes pectin, beta gluten, and galactomana. The insoluble part is mainly cellulose and some of the hemicellulose, and of course, nignum. So out from the plant cell wall, you can see you, you already have this different uh, dietary fiber component. And then and the other uh, part in, uh, in, in plant cell, of course, we know starch. So starch exists in granules. As I mentioned, starch normally should be totally digestible inside, but this is not the case. Um, because when plant is subject to, uh, I mean, when star plant is subject to uh, different treatment, like during poking, um, genetization, okay, will happen, that will solubilize it. And that, of course, will help the digestion. But then a lot of uh, raw starch that you can find in different plant food, because they, they because, um, uh, there are various reasons that will make them not totally digestible in the human uh, gut. So they become we call resistant. And here is a list of the different resistance such that uh, that could be fine in our diets and they all can constitute part of a diet. And if they are resistant to a human digestion, so their fate is that their fate will get to the colon and they can be fermented by the bacteria there and then you have the subsequent physiological effect. So that's why resistance starch now is a very hot topic. People looking at resistance starch to be considered as a dietary fiber, which also have uh, some important physiological functions. Okay, again, I think this um, 
bigger would summarize the, the three most important physical chemical characteristics of fiber uh, that are related to its functional uh, properties. So here we have uh, viscosity, we have solubility, and we have fermentability. So what is shown in here is that the top one here, if the fiber has the highest, the fiber has the highest, um, the most, the, the most soluble, and they, and because they're polymer, so they will have a high viscosity, and then they are fermentable. For so example, a pectin and gelatin. And with these physical chemical properties, those fiber, okay, will, uh, in particular, they will produce this short chain fatty acid SCFA to the fermentation by the bacteria. And again, we will see SCFA, this microbial metabolite, as a very important uh, function of okay, your physiological health. Then, depending on, again, on the solubility, fermentability, and viscosity, so we have this different, we have this uh, different, uh, 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 functions of the fiber. So including uh, whether they will hold the water. Now, what holding cap uh, capacity in the gut is can also affect a lot of functions. And then uh, whether they will form, for example, they will cause a faster transit. So just, and uh, whether they're responsible for the stool bulking, they will of course uh, prevent constipation. Um, so uh, the next, uh, just to, Categorize the different types of fiber we have seen, and then related to uh, these three important physical chemical properties. So I can leave it to you to, to find out there are different um, these type of properties uh, depending on which type of fiber they are. Um, now, for take for take one example, uh, for example, cellulose. Okay, cellulose is both have insoluble, non-viscous, and low fermentability. But it doesn't mean that it, it has no function, right? And then other which have very high, like alginate, okay, uh, from seaweed, they have very high solubility, high with uh, high viscosity, but it's not so fermentable. And for resistant starch, I just show you this again. Uh, the different types of resistant starch, in terms of the physical chemical properties, they can be very different, very different. Um, perhaps I will just point out one of. Oh, uh, okay, since we're talking about uh, uh, processing, so uh, there's one type of resistance that we call retrograde. This is uh, this starch, this resistance starch will be formed when we're doing cooking and cooling. So when we cook our rice and we cook it, then you will find that if you take those rice, you will, you will have a lot of this resistance starch get into you. Okay, now then I think I'll turn to the, uh, the health aspect. Um, here is the, um, a meta-analysis uh, on epidemiology uh, cohort studies uh, of fiber index, talking about 25 to 29 grams per day. And um, I think currently the, the data recommendation of fiber 35 index is, of course, it's very between regions, so roughly 25 to 35 grams, okay, depends on region. And if you look at this study, uh, you will find that uh, the high dietary fiber intake, okay, can result in reduced risk of uh, mortality uh, in a number of um, diseases. So, um, for example, in here talking about coronary heart disease, the mortality, uh, the reduced risk, okay, compared to cancer, okay. So these are based on um, meta analysis of the some cohort studies, and there are also other diseases. Uh, would have we call a lower incidence, so not only probably reduce but lower incidence. So we have the coronary heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and also the colorectal cancer. So uh, there is um, uh, some correlation between fiber intake and various uh, chronic disease. And um, I think at the moment the the more authorized or more authorized health claims for dietary fiber from FDA, the moment that two such claims. So you look at the the wording in the claim is that the first claim is that diets low in fat and high in fiber containing grain products. So your uh, fruits and vegetables may or might reduce the risk of some cancer. The second claim is diets low in saturated fat and cholesterol and high in fruits and vegetables and grain products with that contains fiber may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. So you look at this piece of health claim, 
uh, fiber, of course, is um, included as one of the important components. But as a whole, you see this talking about other low intake in fat, especially saturated fat and cholesterol, in order for you to have uh, this reduced risk. So again, I think the emphasize on balanced diet. Now, uh, I will turn to perhaps talking a bit more specific on um, the physical properties of dye fiber and the physiological responses. Um, okay, we talk about fermentation. So we talk about the bacterial degradation of dye fiber. And the response, the uh, corresponding responses is production of shocking fatty acid. Okay, so this is the most important response. And water holding capacity of, of fiber, uh, because uh, fiber as a Polysaccharides, it had a lot of polar group that can hold the water in the in, in our gut and especially in the colon. And the effect is it affect nutrient absorption, fecal weight, and also the transit rate. And uh, fiber, um, again, depend on its functional group, it can also have some interaction of some organic materials. For example, in our gut, so I think the most important one are the uh, bile acid and some neutral steroids. So they will affect the binding and subsequent excretion of these um, organic uh, compounds. And fiber can also carry charge. Okay, so they can also affect the mineral excretion. Now, maybe let's look at um, maybe uh, a few specific uh, health uh, related um, aspects. So perhaps we look at uh, the cholesterol and, and also the glycemic response. So we have seen the, the Basically, chemical properties of fiber. So, fiber can the biscuits that can provide viscosity in our gut. Uh, first, it will slow the digestion absorption of the carbohydrate, delay the gastric emptying, so the food on the stomach will be empty gradually, okay, not uh, in a very fast pace. And it can also enhance release of uh, hormones like this uh, polycytoskinin. So, again, affects the uh, absorption of the nutrients. Water holding capacity, as we have seen, it uh, can expand the acre space of the small intestine and cause subsequently affect the absorption. Bulking, okay, so, and also bind the bile acid. So, uh, as we see, bile acid excretion uh, will affect our cholesterol risk response. As we know, fiber is non digestible. So, uh, Eventually, it will go to a colon, or we call the large, <clears throat> our large bowel. And again, the physiological, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the physical chemical properties of the fiber, like the water, water holding capacity, this will um, again in the colon, uh, it will create an acre space uh, matrix, allow the microorganism, many bacteria, uh, to break down the polysaccharide structure. Uh, human enzyme cannot break down fiber. For the microorganism, in particular the bacteria that reside in the human colon, they possess the enzyme, the necessary enzyme that can break down the polysaccharide. Okay. And in doing so, uh, it will also produce metabolites, as we see, talk, I mentioned about in the uh, fermentation. Uh, perhaps I think this figure will show you the, how the fiber. Uh, in the colon, we have, we have, we have the, the, the effect that we, that we mentioned uh, er, uh, earlier. So in terms of viscosity, so we're talking about absorptions of glucose and lipids, uh, and then for binding minerals, right? And, and then uh, more importantly, it will affect the microbial growth, and, and then the bacteria will constitute Will increase our spill bulk, okay, and then the um, metabolized searching fatty acid can be absorbed, okay, um, through the uh, the gut and then get into our bloodstream, get into our liver, okay, then they um, have their uh, corresponding uh, physiological functions, right? And another thing is the immunomodulations. Now, actually, it's, uh, the Dietary fiber uh, actually can interact with the our human uh, immune system and also the metabolize from the uh, fermentation. But this together will modulate our immune system, and of course the end result is uh, uh, 
some of the human um, health or, or disease, okay, um, can be alleviated. Uh, I think I emphasize quite a lot about uh, the, the thing happening in the code. And in fact, this, this is true because the uh, physiological effect of dietary fiber really, uh, I would say, we really happen in the colon. So again, I summarize what happened in the colon is you can increase the fecal weight, uh, increase frequency of adaptations, increase chance, decrease chance of time, increase the colon content, now, increase the microbial growth. Now, I think this is one of the most important part. Um, because our gut health, when you talk about gut health, we're talking about a balance of the bacteria uh, inside our colon. So whether the so-called good bacteria dominate or whether the bad one dominate depends very much on the dietary fiber and in particular, the prebiotic that I mentioned earlier. So increase the microbial growth here is a very important uh, consequence of dietary fiber intake that would have uh, health implications. And, and, and others like the decrease of the uh, bile acid uh, hydroxylation and also the production of chocolate fatty acid. So I think this slide perhaps summarizes um, some of the uh, relationship between fiber and the um, uh, some of the human uh, disease or physiological res responses. So again, I think the key thing is whether we have sufficient or we call high fiber in uh, in the and okay. Then um, what's shown in here is uh, again the property, the solubility of fiber play an important role. The viscosity. And against the fermentation aspect, so this again, these three, uh, is the chemical properties. So they are mainly responsible for all these uh, different uh, physiological functions. For example, for diabetics, um, slowing absorption of glucose, okay, through this uh, soluble uh, dietary fiber um, intervention. Uh, then for heart disease, okay, the lowering the cholesterol absorption. Is another key features, uh, and then for uh, colon cancer or colorectal cancer, again the the metabolites produced through fermentation like the SCFA, we also can maintain a healthy colon um, to minimize the colon cancer. And of course, uh, for people who want to have weight control, a fiber can also increase this satiety. Okay, because it produce it's a bit water absorbing properties and you can have a, a bulky uh, diet. And lastly, this part I'll just perhaps just mention about, as I said, the uh, particular type of dietary fiber we call beta glucan. And um, now beta glucan uh, have different origins. So it can come from uh, fungi, mushroom, uh, actually including yeast that we have mentioned. And it can also come from some common, um, our a uh, plant food like uh, oaks and barley, the in cereals, but beta glucan can find uh, in different uh, food source, they have a very different structure. So for example, this beta 1, 3 glucan, you have a linear beta, uh, linear beta 1, 3 uh, main chain, and then you have this uh, 1, 6, uh, we call branching. And then for the oaks and barley beta glucan, you have a mixed linkage of 1, 3 and 1, 4. Now, why I mentioned this is because um, the, uh, the particular type of uh, physiological response I mentioned really depends on the chemical structures of the fiber. So beta, even the beta glucan, but with uh, different uh, linkages like 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 6, all this and their proportion. And of course, uh, like molecular waste, their branching, um, these are all the factors that will affect this uh, physiological function. So, um, we have uh, our lab picture, we have uh, investigated uh, beta glucan um, for quite a while. So um, one aspect is we're looking at beta glucan as a novel prebiotics. Uh, you remember prebiotics is the special type of dietary fiber that can promote the growth of probiotics. Okay, so uh, I think uh, previously uh, beta glucan has not been investigated as a prebiotic, but um, I think this, there are now emerging evidence showing that beta glucan uh, really had this potential. And um, again, uh, dietary fiber has a lot of physiological function. I mentioned about the immunomodulation. 
Um, so we also look at uh, how uh, certain polysaccharides, uh, which are again beta glucan, uh, that derive from muscle that they can have uh, immunomodulatory activity. Uh, and in particular, it will uh, stimulate uh, the, the macrophages okay, to trigger a series of immuno, uh, immune response. Okay. And uh, yes, so uh, we also study the uh, some because structural characterize uh, polysaccharides from mushroom against they uh, they have a different um, chemical structure. So we have demonstrated that uh, in terms of the immunomodular activity, they they can uh, have different uh, degree and effect. So we were trying to establish a so-called structure. A function relationship. Uh, regarding um, the fermentation aspect, as I said, beta glucan as a prebiotic, potential prebiotic, of course, it, we're looking at its fermentability. And in particular, uh, you know, right now, um, uh, the, uh, a lot of um, infant formula, okay? So people are talking about infant formula. Uh, so in fact, in infant formula, you really need uh, prebiotics, okay? in order to give the uh, infants a good gut health. Of course, uh, baby formula can never replace breast, uh, breast milk, but uh, to some degree, uh, uh, one can use uh, some proper uh, prebiotics, okay? Uh, one still can uh, give the infant um, uh, to have a healthy gut. So, so in this regard, we are looking at uh, beta gluten and compare with other carbonides to look at this potential, okay, as the infant formula. And beta glucan or dietary fiber uh, actually can have uh, more fun, uh, I think more other uh, functions that can be explored. And one of this is uh, used as a drug delivery system. Now dietary fiber, because it's non-digestible. So if it's being used to carry some drugs, okay, uh, into our body. And it has the advantage of uh, protecting the, the drug. And also because uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is because I, uh, deep beta glucan uh, has, uh, uh, has interaction with, with uh, immune cells like macrophage. So they will have a target, so-called target delivery that the uh, beta glucan can be uptake by the macrophage and then deliver the drug that it carries. So this is again a potential application that we're exploring. Lastly, perhaps you ask, oh, where should I get my daily dietary fiber intake? So I will use this uh, slide just to give you some idea about the dietary fiber content in various uh, food. Now, what you're showing in here, you have the uh, the fiber content at the y uh, x axis. Okay, it's a lot uh, scale, uh, and then you have a different fiber. Now, I think what one can look at here, uh, because the unit is based on 100 grams. So you will find that actually for, for a common food that uh, is high in water content, like the fruits and vegetables. Okay, so this is about, they have only about 0.5 to 5 gram of dietary fiber per 100 gram. This is normal because don't forget about the water content they have. So usually they can have 80% or more of water in the fruit and vegetable. So oh, you may have to, if you want to get the fiber in the graph, you can convert it into dry weight. Okay, take away the water then, then you will find fruit and vegetable is a very a good source of dietary fiber, right? And, and then cereal, of course cereal compared to fruit and vegetable, their moisture content is much less. Okay, so apparently they have a higher fiber content, so it can up to 15%. Okay. And then legumes, okay, that's all been, okay. So you see, can have a very high dietary fiber content. Again, it's the water content that is less. So, uh, and then the last two here, they are called fiber supplement. Uh, this is uh, actually an extract of the dietary fiber. You can see from the soil, you can from apple, pup, or you from from pear holes. So these are commonly uh, the what we call the dietary fiber ingredient used in the industry. So instead of eating the whole fruit, vegetable, cereals, or legumes. So one can isolate the dietary fiber from the plant source and then use it like a concentrate, okay, that you can add to the food.
But one thing uh, I think one should note is uh, because these are extracted or isolated dietary fiber, so there must be certain degradation because it, as you see, fiber are mainly the plant cell wall materials. So you have to pull this fiber from the intact cell wall. So to a certain extent, this, this extract, I think they have some degradation. And in terms of the chemical structure or perhaps the hydroxyl function that we have mentioned, they, they, I think they will be different from the one we obtain from the natural. And lastly, these are uh, extracellular polysaccharides which have extremely high uh, dietary fiber. So they're mainly, again, from, uh, you can see they're from various sources, like from uh, seaweed is a particular good source of this, uh, like alginate, carrageenan. Okay. So the last slide, okay, I'll maybe make a uh, brief conclusion. So I think the camp of the chemical and physical properties of dietary fiber played an important role in the physiological function that have held implications to humans, right? And I think what we need right now is to be perhaps more clinical trials and epidemiological data to support so-called the evidence-based health claims of dietary fiber. Because at the moment, as we have seen, uh, this uh, is still lacking. So um, I think more of this kind of study to generate uh, enough data uh, to support the claim, I think is uh, urgently needed. Okay, so with that, um, thank you for your attention. Okay, I'll conclude my talk. And here are some references uh, to provide you more information uh, if you want to uh, learn more or you want to know more. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. Yep, yeah. pleasure. Yeah. So um, before we go to the Q&A sessions, so I would like to invite everybody to take a Zoom photo together. Oh. So uh, please turn on your camera and uh, so that we can take, take a photo. Okay, please turn on your camera. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do some friends as not turn on your cameras. Please do so if possible. Okay, so, okay, what? So, um, why don't you take a um, photo for us? Okay, ready, one, two, three, smile. Okay, one more. One, two, three, smile. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we start our QA session. So um who would like to talk, please unmute yourself. If, if your microphone is not working, please uh, send in your questions through the chat box. Okay. Um okay, so Okay, I, I have questions. One is that, uh, like my children, they, they don't like fiber. And also, like, uh, if you really know that, like, all these, uh, uh, the, the, the young bulls, he's against, like, broccoli and all that. And so my lovely wife always buys some of these, like, fiber pew. Fiber pew. Okay. So I would like to hear Professor Chen about the comment about these fiber pills and whether they a good or whatever. Then the second question is about all these uh, trans plants, transgenic plants. I see your chart and whatever. I was actually involved in a lot of beta glucan. And so what would your comment in terms of a certain uh, vegetable, originally they don't have a lot of fiber and if we clone and express a lot of more soluble or fiber or whatever, do you think that that will be the future? For example, I myself don't like tomato, but I would like a lot of Chinese, like Gai Lan. Gai Lan is one of my favorite. And so how could I really enhance it? And do you really see that people like me who have a wish list about, I would eat Gai Lan and then have a lot of fiber. I mean, that would that be a really like a future diet? And then, I, and, 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 and so that would be really tailored to more individualized uh, um, in that regard. All right, 
fiber pills. Okay, that you talk about, I think it's like a lot of supplement. Like, yeah, we call it fiber supplement. Now, I think it, uh, it depends on really the component, okay? Um, the fiber supplement uh, can have uh, different uh, fiber component from isolate from, from different source. So I think if you want, really want to just uh, use fiber supplements to replace your fiber intake from our diet, uh, my personal experience is quite difficult, quite difficult. Because not all types of uh, dietary fiber naturally find in the, um, in our food, okay, can be isolated and then uh, packed or, 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 or form a um, so-called a fiber supplement. Uh, of course, they are not uh, totally useless, I would say. Uh, in fact, certain people, yeah, they really uh, have to rely on fiber supplement, uh, perhaps in certain, uh, with certain uh, circumstances. For some people with a very, um, serious constipation, constipation. Now, I think the, the doctor actually will, will administer them um, some soluble dietary fiber called gua gum. If you, uh, yeah, that's very effective um, way to uh, improve uh, the, the problem of constipation. But um, my advice is, yeah, of course, um, try uh, a balanced diet with uh, different portions of fruits and vegetables. Uh, your second question about using transgenic, um, <laughs> technology to increase a uh, certain type of dietary fiber, is it in the plant food? Uh, well, I'm not a, a GM people actually, um, but if you look at, um, as I have mentioned in the talk, you look at um, uh, the, the cell wall model. I think right now, if you want to increase the dietary fiber, you're talking about you are changing the cell wall material or the cell wall structure. Okay, I'm not sure how, how that really can be um, done uh, to change a cell wall. I mean, if you, uh, the current technology, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, this, 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 this is a part that I can't answer you perhaps, yeah. Maybe, no lamb, you know. <laughs> okay. uh, you can yeah. increase the starch content or protein content, but. Uh, so is metabolic engineering, is possible. Mm. So, so for example, example, you can change the starch uh, composition of rice. Yeah. So if rice has two kinds of starch, brown chain, mm. and straight chain. You can change and change the taste. So for cell wall, it's more complicated. It's quite dynamic. So yeah. you have to uh, do some trial and error. You can always increase the sometimes really take enzymes to, to, to hydrolyze some parts of it. For example, there are some of you should try to reduce the lignin in, in the plants, so that it, it can be more easy for digestion mm -hmm. or to become a biofuel. Right. So they are possible, but as food to the customer who are health concerned, right? They may be quite resistant to GMO. So um, although it's uh, scientifically possible, but it could be difficult to market. This is my my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. So, any, anybody else? Uh, this is Joanna. I, hi. Um, hi. hi, Dr. Chen. Thank you for the presentation. Very informative. Uh, my question is, um, are there any special study, particularly uh, to any population that are low in dietary fiber consumption? This is number one. And number two question is now that there is an increasing interest on plant-based protein diet. So would that increase the chance of dietary fiber intake? Oh, okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, population with low uh, dietary fiber intake, right? Uh, I think the, um, the, there's a trend that, yes, at developing countries, compared to developed country, there's a clear trend that fiber intake is higher in developing countries. Uh, I think uh, like Africa, right? Actually, uh, the, uh, the earliest uh, study fiber study by Trowell is, in fact, you find that the, the African, actually they have the highest fiber intake. It's of course related to their diet. They eat a lot of uh, plant-based, it's a plant totally plant-based diet, I would say, and they have a lot of legumes, okay, so, 
uh, and for developed countries, you know, we're, we're eating a lot of we call um, uh, finely processed food, okay, rather than uh, unprocessed. We're talking we're talking about some highly processed food. Now, highly processing actually usually reduce the fiber uh, content. So unless unless well, uh, you you add the fiber um, externally to to add to enrich the, the fiber content. So um, and also, I think in developed country, usually they, uh, the, the trend is they, they uh, uh, have less uh, intake of uh, fresh vegetable and uh, and fruit, and as a result, uh, so the fiber intake is uh, completely lower than the developed uh, than the developing countries. So I think that, that is quite quite a clear trend, I would say. Yeah, and uh, talking about plant based. Uh, Protein, right? You mentioned about right now. Um, well, uh, I would say uh, the plant-based protein, uh, uh, if it is associated with um, with some type of fiber component, yeah, then I think perhaps that that is uh, one way that one can increase the uh, the type of fiber because um, uh, in the plant cell, uh, protein, uh, certain protein actually they have. Uh, Association with the, um, the the cell wall material, which is the polysaccharide. So you have um, you have glycoprotein, okay, or you have protein glycan, which which usually the the, the glycan part or the the carbon hydrate part, I think is um, is fiber like, I would say. So um, so there's a possibility to to have uh, fiber intake increase, okay, if one um, they switch to plant-based protein. Thank you. Well, I have a question, uh, maybe some comments by myself. So I think the recent trend um, about the diet is that in some, um, some region, the low income uh, populations, they eat a lot of fast food and they are low in uh, fiber. So the fresh vegetable and fruit is quite expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so only the, the health, health cautious rich populations are more accessible to those uh, food fibers. I mean, that is uh, some trend in, in the world that, that is Difference from the past, like 20 years ago, most of the European country they eat semi vegetarian food. So, that is my first observation. The second observation is when we talk like, talking about um, meat analog, like they are plant based analog, they are usually highly processed because uh, in order to make the plants look like a meat, right? So the process, the process is very expensive. So I'm not sure whether they can really increase the food fiber content by um, eating the meat channel. So maybe Peter can comment on that. Uh, it's, it's true. Uh, uh, if you're talking about the, the, the price, right? I think for uh, for fresh uh, uh, fruits and vegetables compared to fast food, yes, in in a, in, in a way you, you want to get a good one. I think the more expensive. I mean the, the fruits and vegetables, and that may be a reasons why uh, the 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 low income population uh, they they may have a low fiber intake because if 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 their diet is being dominated by fast food, and uh, the second one is uh, about the, the plant-based diet. Uh, I believe, uh, yes, uh, to produce really the plant-based protein, perhaps in a piece of burger, right? right. Uh, it's very highly processed. I mean, you you, uh, you not only need the plant protein, but a lot of other ingredients too. And, and in that sense, perhaps you have some uh, room to maneuver well, by adding uh, some component. Uh, which is considered as dietary fiber. Now, right now, there's a there's a quite a lot of um, 
good ingredient, that actually they are they are soluble dietary fiber. Uh, we call it hydrocolloid or we call it gum. That because they can uh, produce some functional properties. The functional properties are not the one we talk about in the, in the food. For example, it can buy water, it can give texture. Okay, and um, so uh, they can be used. Okay, on one hand as a food component, and the other hand to increase the fiber content. So I think the 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 way perhaps to to increase the fiber content in a plant based uh, protein food. Thank you, Peter. So, um, would there be any further questions from the audience? Also, the group audience <laughs> sitting in the room. Okay, so, um, no further questions. So, may I uh, take this chance to do some advertisement for our next talk? So, please share the poster. So thank you everyone for coming to tonight and or, or whatever today. So our next talk is very different from today's talk. Our next talk in October 8th will be on, on, the, on the topic, Food Security and Nutrition in West Africa, a Development Workers' Personal Sharing by Hong Kong youngster who worked in United Nations World Food Program. He's stationed in Africa, and he would like to share his experience in the NGO, how the United Nations trying to develop different program to help the African to combat food security and nutrition issues. So I think it is very interesting and different from science. This is an, an NGO plans uh, for his own experience. So the speaker, on one hand, will give a talk like this on October 8th. He also agreed to come a few hours earlier to the venue to meet with our youngsters, our, our college students, so that they can encourage more people to join the NGO to help others. So uh, if you are interested, right? So you will receive an email invitation from our office. And you can also try to, to come either on, uh, as on the Zoom talk, like the Agrobal Technology talk, that uh, most of you can join. Or if you are in Hong Kong, you are welcome to join the face-to-face -face talk with this uh, Hong Kong youngster, okay? So can you go back to the last night? So if you are in Africa, sorry, you cannot come to face-to-face -face talk. So like friends like Nico, I will be very happy to see your face in Hong Kong, but not yet, <laughs> okay? So uh, please um, join our next talk on the World Food Program in other um, NGO who will work on food security. Okay, so you can scan your QR code to, to register, or you can wait for the email that we will send you invitation. Okay, so um, I guess um, this is the time to thank Peter again. And yeah. thank you, Peter, and thank you for everybody. And we'll see you again on October. Eight. Bye bye. Bye bye.